Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. And it's wonderful to come into a city where there's rain. <laughs> um, I live in, uh, my wife Suzanne, who's with me, and you'll meet her later. We live at, uh, and have lived for some years in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there's plenty of water and woods. It's a very green place, but like the rest of this nation, it's been stricken and uh, temperatures in triple digits for many, many days. And that's the way it's been for us most of the summer because we're now in the last leg of this national book tour and we've been all over the country, deep in, uh, to the eastern United States on the other side of the Mississippi where I sometimes go and all over the Southwest and, and the West, where I prefer to be. Being a Missourian, a native of Missouri, I've always looked West, down the Santa Fe Trail, down the immigrant trails, down my beloved Route 66, the Mother Road. So this is the part of the country that, that I do like the best. And when I declared my major, if you will, as a writer, it was about the American West, not just cowboys and Indians, not just the West that many people uh, think about or conjure up when they hear that word, but the contemporary West as well, uh, the pop culture West, the, the contemporary West. So uh, tonight I'm delighted to be here as always. Uh, I've always had a great experience at Tattered Cover this location or the other, and uh, and I was just saying to someone b before the uh, event started, uh, on this particular tour we've had 40 some odd uh, book signings and events, and only one of them has been in a chain bookstore, and I'm very happy about that, very happy. <laughs> Chains are important to me, but uh, independent bookstores are more important to me. The independent bookstores are like my Route 66. The chain bookstores are like those monotonous turnpikes and interstate highways. I have to take them, but I prefer to be on the old road, uh, the genuine, the authentic, the personal. So, so tonight I'm in this unusual position of really presenting three books, two of them brand new books, not just Crockett, not just David Crockett from Norton, but also The Wild West 365 from Abrams, another brand new book, and then the reissue, My Rascal Son, right in the center, <laughs> Pretty Boy, Charles Arthur Floyd. The Pretty Boy book is not brand new. It was originally published many years ago, but unfortunately it's been out of print until now. Until now, meaning my editor, the original editor, Robert Weil, probably, in my opinion, the best nonfiction editor in the country, moved from St. Martin's, my old house, to Norton, a great house, by the way, Norton, and he brought Pretty Boy back, and it's important to me because it was the second of my three Pulitzer Prize nominations. It's a book that definitely needs to be back in print, and it has been optioned as for major motion picture, as has my more recent biography of Billy the Kid, Billy the Kid, The Endless Riot, another Norton title. So I, I'd be remiss if I wouldn't share with you at least a spoonful from this rascal son, from Charlie Floyd, who hated to be called Pretty Boy. This is really a social history. Where this book ends, uh, Steinbeck's Immortal, The Grapes of Wrath begins. So you go from nonfiction to fiction. And if you've read The Grapes of Wrath, which I assume you have at least once and are planning to reread, you know that the Jodes talk about Charlie Floyd in the book because they came, the fictional Jodes, from Salisaw down in Sequoia County, down in Little Dixie, 
in Oklahoma, where Floyd resided. Uh, they also, of course, uh, uh, Charlie was also the subject of a wonderful song, The Ballad of Pretty Boy Floyd, written by uh, an Oklahoman uh, uh, that all of you uh, will, will probably r remember from, from some of his great songs, and I'm talking about Woody Guthrie. And his ballad of Pretty Boy Floyd, of course, he gave then to Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. Uh, there's a great line that, that fits this book from the ballad of Pretty Boy Floyd. Some men will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. Now Floyd liked to focus on those fountain pen thieves, on those bankers who were foreclosing on the Jodes and, and others. And he truly was, I came to find, much to my surprise and actually to my glee, he was a sagebrush Robin Hood. Very interesting young man. So let me give you a spoonful, if I can, from Pretty Boy, The Life and Times of Charles Arthur Floyd. And it is the prologue to the book. It's short and a little bittersweet. The Conkle Farm near Clarkson, Ohio, October 22nd, 1934. Alongside every outlaw who survives beyond brief days hover this nameless legion whom the law does not know or may not touch. Call them his protective angels, if you like. And that's a quote from When the Daltons Rode by Emmett Dalton. Charlie Floyd ran for the trees and the freedom that lay beyond. If he could just get across the field of corn stubble to the tree line, he would be safe. The weeds and the wild grapevines, the honeysuckle and the brambles would grant him yet another reprieve. He would race into the woods and down the slopes, up the steep hills and across the crumbling masonry of abandoned canal locks filled with water from the recent autumn rain. He was known to some as the sagebrush Robin Hood, to others as the phantom terror, but he was most commonly called Pretty Boy Floyd, public enemy number one. He was invincible and he always got away. The weather was warm on this October afternoon. Charlie's white shirt and silk underwear were soiled and sweaty, and he needed a shave and bath. His dark blue suit was stained and covered with hundreds of tiny thistles, Spanish needles, which ran the length of his sleeves and trousers. He was a country boy dressed in a city slicker's clothes. A farmer's wife had given him ginger cookies and apples that morning, and he stuffed them in his suit coat pockets. He grasped a 45 pistol in one hand while his other pistol was tucked in the top of his trousers. Just moments before, he had chatted with Stuart Dyke and his wife Florence. The farm couple had kindly agreed to give him a lift up the road a ways in their automobile, away from the farm owned by Dyke's sister, Ellen Conkle. Charlie had passed an hour with Mrs. Conkle. She had just fed him a hot meal. Inside the farmhouse, she still held the dollar bill the stranger had insisted she take in exchange for the plate of spare ribs. Ellen Conkle watched him wolf down the dinner she had prepared. He sat in a rocking chair on her porch and ate in silence. Afterward, she saw him pacing around, waiting for Stuart and his wife to finish with their corn husking. Charlie fingered the keys in the car's ignition, deciding not to steal the machine. He waited for the farmer to come along. Just before the dykes walked out of the cornfields, Charlie pulled out his pocket watch. It was almost four o'clock in the afternoon. Sunset was about an hour and a half away. He stared at the 50 cent piece attached to the watch fob. Ellen recalled that he smiled when he rubbed some dirt off the cameo ring he wore. No one knows, but perhaps he thought about Ruby or Dempsey or the cotton fields of Oklahoma and the times before he went on the scout. An airplane, an unusual sight in those parts in 1934, droned overhead. 
Charlie turned his face toward the cloudy sky. The rains of the past few days had disappeared, and even though